Hi, welcome back to Avocet Math. In this video, we're going to look at one last problem from the USSR Olympiad problem book on uh, integer equations. And I like this particular problem because it looks very intimidating at first glance, but it's it's quite accessible to the methods and techniques that we've uh, we've uh, gone over in the last couple of videos. So uh, let's take a look at what we have. We want to find all distinct pairs of positive integers which satisfy the equation x to the y equals y to the x. And uh, this is not very well phrased, but in this uh, instance, distinct pairs means that we're looking for uh, x not equal to y. So we're not looking for trivial solutions like 2 to the second is equal to 2 to the second. We're looking for x not equal to y. Okay, so let's take a look and see how we can uh, approach this problem. Um, it looks like we're going to be able to do some factor comparison at some point, but we don't quite know what to compare to yet. So we're going to have to write x and y in some generalized fashion to kind of get this problem started. So I'm going to write x as some uh, prime number p to some exponent uh, times some prime number q to some exponent. And I may need to introduce a third or a fourth prime number at some point, but for now I just want to get a feel for how this works, so just leave it, let's leave it at uh, p and q for now. So we want to write y in a similar form, but what we first realize now is that because y and x both sit at the bottom of these equations, uh, their prime factor bases have to match up. We can't introduce a new factor to y that doesn't already appear in x. So we already see a relationship here that whatever p and q we put in x here, we also have to include for y. Now the exponents on y can be different, so let's call that c and d for now. And we already have a little bit of a, a jump here in that we know that uh, there are some relationships here that we should be able to, uh, to work with. So taking, uh, given these values for x and y, we can plug this back into this equation here. We now have x is p to the a, q to the b, times an exponent is equal to y p to the c, q to the d, to an exponent. And at this point, it's not clear as to whether we should put in the full-blown values for x here and the full-blown values for y over here. That would be very messy, and we may have to do that at some point. But for now, let me just try to get away with putting an x and a y here and see what we might be able to learn from that. So now we bring this exponent down through this uh, this uh, parentheses here, and we find that we have p to the a y q to the b y is equal to uh, p to the c x uh, q to the d x. And now we're, we have a very good handle on, on what's going on here. We know that since the, the prime number bases are the same, in order for this equality to hold, we know that uh, the exponents have to match up as well. So from that, we can write the equation that ay has to equal cx, and by has to equal dx. So now, we, again, we don't know what x or y are, but we can seems like we can generate a relationship between a and b and c and d. So let's just divide these two to have a over b is equal to c over d. So that looks pretty, pretty useful. Um, this is not quite the ratio that I think is the most useful. Uh, it turns out that we can generate equivalent ratios by swapping the numerator and the denominator on either sides. So try to work this equation and see if you can convince yourself why that's true. So if we swap a for d and d for a, we find that we can also generate the equation that c over a is equal to d over b. And this looks really handy now because c over a is kind of how this exponent relates to this exponent d over b is how this re exponent relates to this exponent. And uh, it appears is that if we're trying to solve for, say, y greater than x without loss of generality, we know that one of these exponents has to be greater than the other. But what this ratio tells us is that if one is larger than the other, then the d also has to be larger than b. And they actually have to be larger by the exact same factor. We'll call that factor m where m is some number like 2, 3, 4, we don't know what at this point. And at that point, we can uh, basically write c as a function of a. c is equal to this ratio factor m times a, and likewise d is equal to that ratio factor times b. And this looks really handy now, because this means that we can 
plug C and D into this equation and write Y as a function of X. So we basically see now that Y is equal to P to the C, which we know is equal to MA, P to the MA, times Q to the MB. And if we pull the M exponent out, we quickly see that this looks very promising now in that we have the expression X now. So we have Y uh, represented as X to the M. So this looks very promising now. And uh, from here, we can uh, basically bring this up to the top side here. And we know that uh, plugging Y equals XM into this equation here, we find that X to the x to the m is now equal to y, which is x to the m to the x. And it's a little tricky here. You have to keep these, uh, these brackets and parentheses uh, straight. Otherwise, uh, you're going to slip the exponents. So uh, we can bring the x through this bracket now and find that uh, this is equal to x to the mx, and since these two bases are now equal, we can equate the two exponents. So what we find now is that uh, x to the m is equal to mx. And at this point, we have to sort of pause for a second and realize that there's, there's no really good way to proceed from this point on. The x and the m are kind of uh, bound together in ways that are difficult to uh, isolate algebraically. But what we notice here is that both of the left side and the right side increase as m and x increase, but we notice that the left side here increases much, much faster than the right side. And so what that tells us is that the only opportunity for this equation to work out is when x and m are relatively small. And so we can basically examine this now under uh, kind of the assumption that this can only work for small values of x and m. So let's quickly look at what x to the m looks like as a function of m from 2, 3, and 4, and x of 2, 3, and 4. So 2 to the square is like 4, 8, 16, 9, 27, 81, 16, 64, 256. And likewise, if you look at the product, x, m, for x of 2, 3, 4, m of 2, 3, 4, we end up with 4, 6, 8, 6, 8, 9, 16, 12, 12. And we notice that this table here gets large very quickly, much faster than the table on the right. So the only opportunity for xm to equal x times m is in this range here. And we notice from this table of uh, nine elements, there's really only one element that is equal. The other elements are not equal, and beyond this range, x to the m increases much, much faster than x times m. So this is kind of the last opportunity for these two to ever meet. And so from this, we can basically see that the only available solution is for x to equal 2, m to equal 2, and therefore y is equal to 2 squared, which is equal to 4. And that is the only solution. So anyway, a little bit of a roundabout solution, but uh, it got us there. So hope that helped. Bye-bye.